nonfiction programming at Showtime and a conversation between Tom Powers and Vinny Malhotra. Tom Powers is the lead docs programmer here at TIFF. He's the co-founder of Doc NYC, the largest doc festival in the US, as well as the host of the podcast Pure Nonfiction, where he has conversations just like the one you're about to see about the world of doc storytelling. Vini Malhotra is the executive vice president of nonfiction programming for Showtime Networks. An award-winning executive, he oversees the development and production of the network's glowing, growing slate of original, unscripted, and documentary programming, as well as all documentary theatrical releases. He is representing two films at the festival this year, Ready for War and The Kingmaker, and his previous credits at Showtime include Wiener, Eric Clapton, Life in 12 Bars, Whitney, Can I Be Me, The Fourth Estate docuseries, and XY Chelsea. Join me in welcoming Tom and Vinny. Hi, Tom. Thank you. Uh, so uh, before I bring out uh, Vinny, I'm going to uh, cue a clip and just uh, say a few words about um, Showtime. The, uh, Vinny Malhotra, before he was at Showtime, uh, did just, uh, several years at uh, CNN, um, uh, helping to grow their feature documentary team and, uh, and doing a great job of it. Um, and then he moved to uh, Showtime a few years ago, and I, I'd always felt that Showtime uh, was a uh, was a, was a brand that could be doing a lot more with documentaries. You'd see brands like uh, HBO or A and E who had these uh, great icons who were leading that. Sheila Evans at HBO or uh, Molly Thompson for so many years at A and E now at Apple. And uh, and Showtime felt like they could be doing that, should be doing that, but uh, but they didn't have that person uh, in place to do that. And since Vinny Malhotra has uh, joined that team. A few years ago, I feel like they've had that person, and it's really uh, galvanized um, what they're doing. So there's, um, the, we'll, we'll be talking about some of the films and series uh, they've been doing lately, including the two that, uh, that Danae mentioned that are here, Ready for War and The Kingmaker. Uh, but to start, uh, they put together a teaser reel of, uh, of their work, so let's look at that from Showtime. Welcome, Vinny Malhotra. Hello. Uh, so, Vinny, can you talk about, you know, since you joined the team at Showtime, what's the, how you would describe your, the focus on documentary? Sure. Um, I think what you said was, was very apt in terms of um, part of the reason why I actually ended up at Showtime. Um, I think that there has been a long-standing foundation of documentaries at Showtime, but primarily um, they were never really that woven into the overall programming strategy at Showtime. It was a little bit of here and there. There'd be, you know, um, something they'd acquire out of a film festival, and then there would be something like Prophet's Prey by Amy Berg or Listen to Me, Marlin, or whatnot. So it was a little bit of up and down. Um, but at the head of Showtime, what we had was a true passionate lover of documentary films and David Nevins, um, also married to a documentary filmmaker, Andrea Nevins. And I think that there was a great desire there to, um, to grow that particular aspect of programming for Showtime. So I saw a great opportunity uh, to come over there and to work with David and to work with the team at Showtime. Um, and it has been a terrific past five years in which we've really grown that slate and I think have taken some 
bold steps, at least for Showtime, um, and also have kind of come to a place where we have more seamlessly integrated it within the programming strategy. Um, in general, I think the landscape of premium nonfiction, I think, has grown exponentially, as you know, as well as anybody else in the past, I'd say, you know, decade. Um, there were a few tipping point projects in particular I, you could reference, like I'd say the Jinx was one of those um, tipping points. Um, and now we're in a very crowded landscape where you have streaming services and basic cable and pay cable and independent, um, you still have, you know, PBS and HBO and others that you've mentioned. So um, in that big space and in that cloud, there was a question of what is our voice going to be? How, are we, how do we cut through? And I think it's very important to have a brand and to really approach it with a filter in mind. Um, I love documentary. I can see so many. I can watch one and I can realize that's a marvelous film, but it doesn't necessarily fit with the brand that we're trying to create. So the brand that I think in terms of at least the way that we look at it and the way that we talk about it is really to try to be um, kind of a mirror of our times, is really to try to stay contemporary. We rarely do historical storytelling. Um, we do in many cases, but it's usually when there's something very relevant, uh, currently relevant about that story and why we'd go back to retell it. Um, but I look at it much in the same way that I look at certain other media brands that I've always admired, uh, brands like Vanity Fair or Rolling Stone and other places like that. And what I mean by that is that there's a great breadth of story but inside of it, there's a great consistency in terms of the quality of the storytelling, the filmmaking and whatnot. And so I think that you can do a film about an icon like Marlon Brando. You can do a music film. You can do um, you know, something that's much more in the realm of journalism and current affairs. Um, and you can do you know, all of that within one brand because um, it's really about how you tell those stories, how you present those stories. And I think that there's something that I feel personally, you know, documentary for the longest time had been really for a documentary audience. And I think we're now in a place where you're seeing it has gone, it has become far more accessible, more broad. Um, I think audiences with that were not traditionally documentary audiences are now really coming to the table. And I think that there's some easy draws there. You know, any great kind of music documentary, I think, draws a lot of a broad audience. But I think we're at the point now where we can tell stories about you know, Chelsea Manning and her incarceration and everything else, and we can tell stories about the political process in a manner that I think feels really, um, really alluring to a broad audience. Well, let me ask you about the two films that uh, are here at TIFF, sure. uh, and to uh, use them as an examples to, to understand what you saw in those films when you got involved and in how you interacted with the filmmakers. Um, we can start with Ready for War that had its world premiere last night. Uh, Ready for War uh, is about the phenomenon of immigrants to the U.S. who served in the U.S. military, only later to be deported. In the case of the three uh, men you look at in the film, all, they were all deported to Mexico. Um, and then the, the other part of that vicious cycle is once they get to Mexico, they're being recruited by drug cartels who are all too happy to get a U.S. trained soldier sure. um, into their militia. Uh, so in th uh, the case of that film, the filmmaker Andrew Renzi, he's made a couple films, but he's uh, not of a stature of a Barbara Koppel or, sure. uh, or, uh, or even Lauren Greenfield, who made the other uh, film. He's still a rising uh, filmmaker. It's not a... It's not as strong a strong personality-driven uh, film, right. e even like The Kingmaker with Imelda Marcos, who there's an icon that you can just put into a caption and people know who that is. Right. So uh, I'd love to hear from you what drew you to Ready for War um, and, uh, and when you got involved. I think what drew me, me personally to Ready for War, but I think to Showtime, uh, is similar to when you did the introduction last night at our premiere, you said something that I think really registered, which is you said it's a story that you did not know very much about, or at all. And I follow Tom on Twitter. I'm very familiar with how politically astute and aware and well-read he is. And even I would like to say that I'm pretty um, well-read in terms of the news. And this is also a topic that I knew nothing about. Um, I was aware that there was deportation, but usually when we talk about deportation, we're, we're really looking at it as kind of in a more mass uh, manner is kind of what we're seeing at the border, never really through this prism, this lens of the military. And I think that there was something very distinctive about that 
window in because it, it is nonpartisan in that sense. You can, from, from both the left and the right, you have to look at what's happening in that particular case. Um, so I think I was excited by the fact that this was a story that was relatively fresh and new to me. And I was also really taken by a very young up and coming filmmaker in Andrew Renzi and the boldness with which he approached this story. Um, I think that there's a beautiful simplicity in the narrative in which he follows and tracks three different characters and seamlessly kind of overlaps their narratives together. But I think the boldness is really in that kind of Matt Heineman-like spirit of spending that much time in Juarez and shooting over 300 hours with cartels and everybody else down there. Um, but I think also doing it in a manner where it is not just a full-scale adrenaline rush or um, kind of delving into deep, like, toxic masculinity in any way. I think that he tells a very touching, poignant story and I think really humanizes even the one um, vet within those three that I think has kind of, in my, my, my terms, has kind of crossed over to the dark side and is really now working as a Sicario for the Juarez cartel. Yeah. Um, can you describe what you saw? Like, what, were, what was literally the way the project was first presented to you? Sure. Was it a 10 minute sample reel? Was it a 90 minute rough cut? So we were, we're working on, um, you know, on, a, on occasion I work in some of the scripted side of the business as well. We were working on a, a story that's, um, I'd say kind of loosely inspired um, by a true story uh, that uh, David Ayer was working on for Showtime and he had brought up this topic to us in this documentary. He had, had gotten involved, him and his, his partner Chris Long in it. Um, and so at the time when we watched it, uh, Andrew had shot a lot of the material. He was still going in and out of Mexico to shoot. And they showed us, I'd say, probably a 10 minute reel of his footage. And I'd say probably three minutes into that, I, I was very aware that we were gonna jump on board and, and try to make this project with him. And uh, once you're on board, is what's the editorial process uh, like? Are you giving notes? Um, how does that work? Um, the, it becomes like an immediate collaboration, I would say, in that regard. So the conversations start to go from there. As they're going back in and out, we're talking about what they're shooting, what they're coming back with. Um, you know, they had a very specific vision and, and frame of how they wanted to tell the story. So that kind of, I think, uh, we were very supportive of and we went with. And then it's a series of cuts that come in, we give notes, we kind of go through that process. But I'd like to think that there are various ways of giving notes, in particular on features. And I think that we have been lucky enough to work with a lot of very established uh, filmmakers, many of whom I think are tour in nature and have a particular vision. So I think when you're doing notes, so to speak, with somebody like, a, like an Alex Gibney or a Liz Garbus or people like that or Lauren Greenfield, you know, they really do have a good, strong sense of what they want to do. And I think that the role is really to have a very ongoing conversation that feels more broad in terms of its narrative and, uh, and talking about structure rather than, you know, time code notes of this, yeah. you know, this and that. So it always leads to these really strong and great editorial conversations where I think that the role I would see of Showtime or myself in that process is really to create an environment around this filmmaker and um, kind of present them with the opportunity to make the best, absolute best version of the story that they want to tell. Support them through that process. Um, sometimes that could be a therapy session, you know? <laughs> sure. Sometimes that can be a very detailed conversation. Sometimes it can be a tough conversation of um, maybe having to switch certain people on the team, whether it's an editor or a producer. Um, and I think that that really kind of ebbs and flows based on the filmmaker and and their what they need, yeah. and then what they need. So let's talk about the other film, uh, The Kingmaker by Lauren Greenfield. Sure. This is a, a, a portrait of Imelda Marcos um, in recent years as, as she's uh, making various efforts to regain power, uh, partly through uh, running her son for election uh, in the Philippines. Um, when did you uh, come on board that project and what were the attractive things uh, about it for you. So Lauren actually had agreed, had, had taken the project to David Nevins, I think, all right before I had even arrived at Showtime. So we're talking I think maybe six, seven years ago almost is when this process started to begin. So when I first got there, Lauren had just begun filming um, this film. 
Um, and I would say that the, the conversation in terms of what that film was at that time, let's say five years ago, is quite different from what the film actually is today. And I, I really marvel at Lauren's process through these past five, six years. I don't think that this was an easy story to tell at all. I don't think that this is an easy story to make sense of in a lot of ways. But Lauren, I think, really... I'm ex so excited for people to see this film because I think Lauren Greenfield, who's a phenomenal filmmaker, has really stepped outside of her own comfort zone in this project, where as the story in the Philippines continued to evolve, she evolved with the story and the film began to grow and began to go into a different place. And I think that that different place carried Lauren away from what her traditional approach to storytelling had been. With I the mean, for anyone characters. who doesn't know, Lauren Greenfield has a long career of... Uh, as, as a photographer first and then as a sure. filmmaker, one of the lasting through lines of her career is photographing wealth and consumerism, people of uh, high wealth. And so Imelda Marcos um, would have been an obvious uh, 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 target for, sure. uh, for her um, as, uh, as someone who's famous for her ostentatious thousands of shoes. And I think that that's probably what everybody began to think that the film was going to be about. It was really going to be about the extravagance of Imelda Marcos and the shoes and everything else. And I think what it has become is a study in, obviously, power and the corruption of power, but this rise and fall and then rise again of a political dynasty in a country, a very complex and complicated country and political system. And I think to see how the Marcos family controlled power um, in some ways looted the Philippines, were, were, were exiled, and then to return, and now to be pushing back into power with another generation of the family, um, and working very closely with the very controversial new president of the Philippines, is a marvelous look. And, and I think that Lauren, for the first time, really has to work deep in archive. She's much more of a verite filmmaker, as I think anybody who's seen her other films would know. And I think that between uh, leaning into the, uh, the archive and then also, I think, stepping a little bit more into a political spectrum oh. has been really remarkable to watch. And I do think it's, I would dare say that I think it's her finest work. Um, well, you can find out today at uh, <laughs> 6.45 when the film has its uh, premiere. Um, I want to talk about uh, series, because uh, the rise of documentary series, you use the Jinx as a reference point, uh, which I think was one of the signifiers of that uh, rise, uh, along with Making a Murderer and yes. so many others. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, it's a, a big thing in our space today, in that uh, showreel we saw a glimpse of a new series that just went up a week or two ago called Couples Therapy. Sure. Um, uh, you have a series coming out later this fall, glimpse there, called uh, Murder in the Bayou um, in the true crime uh, genre. Uh, Liz Garbus, who you mentioned before, did The Fourth Estate going inside the New York Times uh, Trump coverage team. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you think documentary series are uh, at today, where this trend line is going, and what your own appetites are. Sure. I think that there has been a natural evolution of the doc series in the sense of, I often joke and say that the documentary features an endangered species because a lot of the filmmakers that we've traditionally you know, grown to love and watch their features really approach us now and talk about multiple parts. You know, I think they're excited by the idea of being able to say, take a story that they would have normally had to tell in 90 minutes and now have four hours to tell that story, or in some cases, six hours, in some cases, eight hours. Um, I think that- Didn't they know that their 90 minute films are already too long? <laughs> exactly. I think that there is definitely, um, a, a massive trend in that. We're seeing a lot of traditionally doc feature filmmakers making series. And I think that there's something very exciting about that. There's something exciting about seeing, watching Morgan Neville, you know, do a four part series about Rick Rubin in the Shangri-La studio, or Liz Garbus do the New York Times, or Matt Heineman, you know, be able to track the heroin and uh, trade through Mexico into the United States in four hours. So 
um, it's been exciting to do that. I think what we, we don't necessarily have hard and fast rules of how many series we want to do or how many features we want to do. I think it's a little bit of the luxury of what we do at Showtime of being slightly more boutique in the approach of, in terms of what we do. We really look for the projects that I think exemplify what we want the brand to be and you know, we really want to work with the best storytellers we can, we can find. And I think in doing that, um, we do end up getting, I think, much deeper into certain stories. I think that there, for instance, um, you take a story like Wu-Tang Clan of Mikes and Men. I think that on the surface that um, could just appear as, oh, it's the story of a rap group from the 90s. But as important as it is to tell that story, because I do think that that was a step forward in terms of music documentary, which I think had become in some ways slightly stale in terms of its kind of cradle-to-grave traditional approach, this was also as important as what the story is you're telling is who is telling that story. And I think in Sasha Jenkins, we were able to find somebody who, was, who kind of reaches down deep and finds a much more intriguing coming of age story of kids with PTSD from growing up in the worst neighborhoods of New York and how that kind of manifests into the music and their careers. But to your point about these series, um, you know, I think that the, the key is to find, to be pretty, you know, tight in terms of your filter of what's going to work, um, and also to keep filmmakers really disciplined in terms of how many hours. I think that there are certain series out there that are much too long. They're probably three or four hours too yeah. long in some cases. So we try to keep them as compact as possible, and some get longer and some are different. I think in the two that you mentioned, couples therapy is a really interesting one. Um, it is from Elise Steinberg and Josh Kriegman, two the directors of Wiener. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what they found in Wiener was they were constantly getting approached about um, how everybody was so focused on Huma Abedin and Anthony Wiener's marriage. And the greatest, most compelling moments were when the camera lingers in the room after people have left and you see the marriage under fire in yeah. some ways. And so I think they wanted to kind of take that idea and find another project that would capture that as well. So on the surface, I think it's a very obvious thing in some ways to say, oh, we're going to watch couples going through therapy. But because of the filmmakers, because of their style, because of the nuance and the subtlety and the filmmaking and the craft that they bring to it, it is really marvelous. I mean, it is. it has a very indie spirit to it. It's very cinematic in many ways. And it is definitely addictive. And then with Murder in the Bayou, um, this comes also from a director, Matthew Galkin, and Julie Goldman, a very iconic um, documentary producer as well. And you know, you have programmed the Capote tapes. We were talking briefly about that. Um, I've always been a long lover of, of Capote's work. And I think with crime, there is so much true crime storytelling in the documentary space. And so we had taken years to get to the point of putting out the first true crime series that we were going to do. And we wanted to find something distinctive about it. And in this case, it really is trying to capture some of the spirit of you know, what Capote often talked about in terms of the nonfiction novel and really trying to, you know, and what's so marvelous about In Cold Blood is the idea that he tells the story through the bad actors in some ways, that he realizes that the victim, the family, and the town itself in some ways was quite ordinary and had this extraordinary thing take place, whereas the killers were far more um, compelling to him. And that was very controversial about that book. But in this case also, it is a similar task of let's try to tell this in a very nonfiction novel-like way. Let's try to also get inside the bad actors within this place and this town and try to tell the story from that perspective. And I think in doing so, it's become a very interesting and intriguing and mysterious look at this murder, at a series of murders that took place in this town in Louisiana. So uh, a lot of filmmakers uh, in the audience and watching this, and uh, the natural question is, you know, how do we get our project idea uh, to you? And uh, I think anytime some kind of uh, 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 broadcaster is on stage here, you know, th there's a kind of general answer is like, yeah, we want to see it, uh, you know, if it works for us. Um, but so. It's not a very satisfying answer because, sure. uh, like, if, if 800 people send you uh, their projects tomorrow, uh, it'll take you weeks just to sort through them. Sure. So, uh, you know, I wonder if you can talk about, you know, the, the what what a filmmaker should think about in you know in creating a team around themselves or 
giving themselves the best possible leverage and advantage uh, before um, you know, making the efforts to just uh, send a middle envelope with a DVD in it, uh, <laughs> if that even happens anymore. Sure, it does actually happen. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was aging myself. I, <laughs> I wouldn't, I won't stand up here, and, I mean, I won't sit up here and, and, and kind of tell you that any, anything that you have, just send in and we'll take a look at it. I think that that would be not telling the truth in terms of how things work. Um, obviously, we work with a lot of established filmmakers, but it, we really, it is incumbent on um, places like Showtime and documentary brands, I think, to always be out there looking for new voices and fresh perspectives. And I think if you don't do that, you don't find people like Andrew Renzi, you don't find people like Sasha Jenkins. And so I, I believe, though, to be very honest with you, the kind of cold call or just sending the, the envelope, it never really works that way with a place like us. But I do think that documentary is a very tight community of people. Um, and I think that when you really kind of look at your kind of network of people, there's probably other filmmakers within there, doc programmers within there, um, producers within there, and somebody who has a connection, I'd say, to somebody at Showtime or to me or whatnot, is a very good avenue of at least kind of um, registering first. And you know, it, I will honestly say that we are absolutely trying to find new and fresh perspectives of storytelling and new filmmakers. So. Um, we are, we do have our ears perked up for that, but I think just in the space of kind of the volume of submissions or ideas or pitches that kind of come in on a weekly and monthly basis, I think to have somebody pick up the phone and call us or email us and say, hey, why don't you check out this thing, I think that that is really very effective. And I'll tell you, I've had very established filmmakers like Gibney and other people really say, um, this, is, this person is not very well known, but you should look at this deck, or you should look at this pitch, or you should look at this um, treatment or reel that they've sent through. Um, also, I think as we kind of get into, you know, relationships with people like you and people at Sundance and other places, you know, it's very helpful when we get into, say, like a Sundance lab and we get to see somebody who kind of got some seed money from Tabitha Jackson or other people like that and you get a kind of quick glimpse at it. I think that that idea also of kind of bringing us together in that regard is, is good. I can still remember the first time I saw a snippet of footage from Cartel Land, you know, in one of those areas, and it wasn't as if Matthew was a very well-known filmmaker at that time. So I do think that I, my suggestion is always to really think about your network, figure out your network, and I know that everybody wants to help somebody else to kind of get those projects made, and I think it's also incumbent on us to keep a very close eye out for those types of things. Yeah. Uh, just a minute uh, left. Uh, that went we fast. talked about uh, murder in the bayou. Uh, highlight something else for us uh, coming up that we should be looking out for from uh, Showtime. Um, we have another crime series uh, coming up from um, Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady, and it's their first series as well, um, which I think is very exciting. And it is a crime that they that I don't believe anybody has actually heard of or seen yet. Mm. And they kind of follow it in real time, and it unravels. I've heard a little rides. bit about this project. Um, I'm very interested. Does it have a title yet? It has a title, but we haven't announced it yet, okay. so I'd like to kind of hold okay, back a little okay, bit. Okay, 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 fair. But what I will say is, um, in this world of what we were talking about, this huge cloud of true crime stories, I'd say that the big pet peeve is that if you're, as you're watching something, you can always kind of pick up your phone and you can look through and you can figure out how, say, like Wild Wild Country ends or something like that it ends. Mm -hmm. What's marvelous about what they're doing is you cannot do that in this case. Like, you really have to wait week after week to kind of see how this unfolds. So that's very exciting. And then, you know, we also had previously announced um, a film that we're doing about um, Saudi Arabia. And I think, uh, you know, working with Rick Rowley, who had done a great film for us called 16 Shots about the Laquan McDonald yeah. police shooting in Chicago, and obviously was nominated for his film Dirty Wars many years ago, a few years ago. Um, so Rick is directing a film that Act Gibney and Lawrence Wright oh. and a few others are producing. And it's really kind of inspired by uh, the Khashoggi murder, but it's really not just about that. I think that what we all realized about that incident and that situation was if you don't have the context, the larger picture of Saudi and the US and this uh, very complicated entanglement we've had for decades and decades um, rooted in oil and, and other 
business, um, I don't think that you can really understand the complexities and the nuances of what really took place in that and why it's so significant. So um, that's very exciting. They've been kind of deep into that project. Um, that's so great. Thanks. Can't wait to see them. Uh, do try to see Ready for War and or the Kingmaker uh, here at the festival. Uh, stay in your seats. We're going to finish this day off with a conversation with uh, Barbara Koppel, documentary legend, uh, and we're just going to do a quick turnover of the stage. Thank you very much, Vinny. Thank Nelhoza. you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks.